what it means to my family, to me, and to all those dealing with Theo Caro to have your support. At this time, I'd like to introduce Amy Pixar, a very special person who, like me, understands this condition in a personal way. In fact, not only does she understand it, her brother understands it, and her father understands it. All of them understand what it is to live with theochromocytoma and paraganglioma. And of course, as my dad said earlier, that means that not only are Amy, her brother, and her father living with this condition, but in some way, the rest of their family is too. Like me, Amy didn't plan for this, but she got it. And like me, she decided to turn it into a positive and reach out to others with our condition. But unlike me, Amy was further along in life when it was discovered. She had already had her first child. So you'll understand from her story, what my dad said earlier, that Theo Parent has no rules. It strikes people in different stages of life, and it can strike more than one member of your family. Listen to her story. It's riveting. I want to sincerely thank her for sharing it tonight. Please give a warm welcome to Amy Pixar. And they were on both sides of my neck. 
And so I basically spent a whole year having surgery. And after they took one side, they went in and got two of them out. That was in January. In May, they went in the other side and got another one out. And they said, there's still something wrong. You have really high catecholamine levels. We think you have another tumor. And sure enough, they found one on my adrenal gland. So they went in and took that one out as well. And as they started to describe what these tumors do to you, everything kind of made sense to me. Like all the things in my life, like my near-death pregnancy, and all the high blood pressure episodes that I had absolutely no idea, because no one was looking for a pheochromocytoma. It's just too rare. And when I went back and I told my OB about this, I said, I have a pheochromocytoma. He said, no way. You can't possibly have that tumor. Because if you did, I would have killed you during childbirth. And it came pretty close to actually happening, actually. And I took away from that thinking, well, God's not finished with me yet. So I went on about my life after I was clean, and I thought, surely I'll get another 10 years before this affects me again. I had another baby, and I thought, okay, things are good. I was living the high life, climbing the corporate ladder, it was over with. I was past that stage. But then in 2004, I had a very unexpected pregnancy, a blessing, but unexpected. And I had these memories of what happened to me during my first pregnancy, so I was a little concerned, you know, going into a pregnancy again, that maybe it wouldn't be so lucky this time. So sure enough, in my eighth month, I had high norepinephrine levels. And being kind of a, a geeky engineer that I am, I plotted out my levels over the months, and I could see this very uh, trend, you know, this trend in my norepinephrine level. And so I knew that there was something wrong. And I found a high-risk OB to help me through my pregnancy, went to the IU Med Center. But in the back of my mind and in the bottom of my heart through this whole time, I knew that there was something in there, and that eventually I would have to find it. But it was probably two years before I really got serious about looking into it again. Because to be honest, I didn't want to know. I had watched my brother struggle for so many years and, and have such a struggle with his quality of life that I just didn't want to go there again. And sure enough, they found it after 10 MRIs and three gated MRIs. They found it under my right coronary artery on my heart. And I remember I got bounced around from doctor to doctor because nobody knew what to do with that. And I felt like I was like looking for a bomb squad expert to come in and take this tumor off my heart. And finally, I did find a doctor at the Mayo Clinic. And he had only done this operation on two other people in front of me, which is kind of scary, but two times is better than none. So we went there, and, and they had planned to have the operation at the Mayo Clinic. But I remember right before my surgery, it was probably two weeks, they sent me this pretty booklet that was what to expect when you have heart surgery. And right there on the fourth page was this illustration of this person laying there with tubes coming out of everywhere and an intubation tube down their throat. And it said in big bold words, the patient may be intubated for up to four days. Four days. All I could think about was that vision of my brother trying to pull that tube out and struggling. And I thought, I can't do that for four days. There's no way that I can, that I can handle that. And, you know, they could have said to me, we're going to stick pins in your eyes. And it wouldn't have had the same effect as you're going to be intubated for four days here. And I lost it. And I'm not that kind of person. You know, my poor husband, I'm kind of a demanding, take life by the horns kind of person. And I was completely falling apart after this. Because all I could think about was that too. And I spent days in the emergency room. Every time I started thinking about that silly tube, my blood pressure would go up and I couldn't bring it back down. So he would take me to the hospital. And he finally said, can't we just sedate her? Just, just give her something so I can get her up there and get, get the surgery taken care of. And that's pretty much exactly what they did, thank goodness. So we get to the Mayo Clinic and I'm preparing for surgery. And I'm laying on the gurney, surrounded by all of my family. And I remember looking up into the face of my beautiful little two-year-old baby, little toe-head guy. 
And he's looking at me like, Mommy, why are you laying there? Why won't you come and help me? And I just started to cry because I had this horrible dread come over me. And I thought to myself, this is it. I'm not coming back from this. And I'm a really, I'm a really positive person. I'm a can-do. I don't know the word can't, but I knew that there was something just not quite right about the situation. So I closed my eyes and I said a prayer and I just said, God, please, just get me through this. Just get me to the other side of the surgery, and I'll do whatever you need me to do. I'll, I'll give up my comfortable life. I'll follow whatever path you want me to be on. All you have to do is just show me the way, and I'll do it. And sure enough, I, I did wake up from that surgery. And I did have the tube down my throat. Thank goodness it wasn't for four days. But I just remember being angry because I wanted to talk. I couldn't speak with that silly tube down my throat. And I got back up started to walk around because that's the best way to get back on your feet, get back to good health. And I remember they let me out on Christmas Eve. That's how close it was to Christmas at that surgery. And all I wanted to do was go home. I just wanted to go home and see the babies that, that I left at home. And so we drove about 12 hours from the Mayo Clinic all in one day, and I did make it home for Christmas. And I saw my kids. But it was kind of a strange Christmas, you know, because I was still kind of feeling bad and my kids weren't quite sure what to think of the whole thing. Once we made it through Christmas and it was all over, and it was just me and the four walls and a really long road to recovery, the realization that I had made that deal with God hit me like a ton of bricks. And I had to figure out what it was we wanted me to do. And I didn't just have to figure out, I was frantic. I paced the, the halls of my house, I walked circles, I tore the carpet up, trying to figure out what, what was it that God had set me out to do? Why did he bring me through this surgery? I had to know. And I asked my husband, I drove him crazy, this poor guy. I said, what do you think? What do you think it is every day? What do you think it is that I am supposed to do with my life? Why did he give me this chance? And he said, maybe, maybe he just wants you to be a mommy. Maybe he just wants you to raise these kids. And I knew that that was true, but at the back of my mind, I knew that there was something more. I just didn't know what it was. And it drove me crazy. And so a couple of years went by, and every day I searched for that reason. What was it that I was supposed to do? And it was actually right here in Persephone, two years ago, that I finally figured it out. I came together with a very dear friend of mine, Laura Bechtel, who passed away from this disease in February, and Matt Capagreco and Alan Wilson. And we started to talk about what it is we needed as patients. And we knew that we needed a support group, because there's so few of us around, that we needed to help each other through these times. But what we realized was that not only could we provide that support, but we could do so much more. Collectively, with all of our talents, we could do so much for this disease. And I remember thinking that everything in my career that I have learned to this point in my life, every skill that I've developed has brought me to this project, to this disease, to helping other people. And we started the group, the Theo Paratroopers. And we set a lot of goals, and we're actually accomplishing them. And, you know, it's a ton of work. Every day, it's a lot of work. But I want you to know that with great certainty that I don't ever consider that work a burden. It is truly a gift for me. Thank you.